Ooh, what do we have here? Another scrumptious young plaything straight out of life and into my club? Mmm, you smell new, little boy. Like fabric softener do on freshly mowed astroturf. Oh, I'm not frightening you, am I, duckling? Please, come in. I do apologize for my sister's crassness if it made you uncomfortable. She's unabashedly scandalous, but... In the club business, I suppose that kind of personality is a necessary evil. To say the sisters Jeanette and Therese Foreman are an enigma is an understatement. Born into a life of trauma and cruelty, each sister displays the lasting effects of their dark past on their sleeve. Therese, tactical, collected, yet manipulative. Jeanette, rebellious, forthright, yet chaotic. Two sides of the Janus face, with each tearing viciously to head in the opposite direction of the other. Whilst they are framed in constant juxtaposition with each other, they exist in a manner of anarchic harmony. They may, in their own ways, hate each other, they also aid themselves in their own individual ways. Whether that's through benefiting their mutual goals, or simply ensuring their survival through each perilous night in Los Angeles. Within our installment tonight, we'll be delving into the mysterious past and present tale of Jeanette and Therese Foreman, uncovering their elder Malkavian sire, their cruel origins, and their endeavors within present nights, and what fate may have befallen them under the shadow of the Second Inquisition. So come with me as we explore the bewildering world of the Vorman sisters. But first, if you enjoy tales from worlds unlike our own, or wish to learn more about the world of darkness, perhaps leave a like or even subscribe as it helps the channel immensely. Through the events of Bloodlines, we are offered a glimpse into the traumatic pre-vampiric life of Therese and Jeanette Vorman. Conventionally, our tale starts with Therese. Therese was very young when she first experienced signs of Dissociative Identity Disorder, a Dissociative Disorder which ranks on the severe end of the spectrum of similar disorders. As a lonely and deprived child, Therese's early interactions with her alter would initially bring comfort within her unfortunate surroundings. This alter namely the identity of Jeanette, would accompany her through her troubled childhood. Due to their father's controlling demeanour, they were confined to the family home, scarcely being allowed outside under any circumstance. Through their moments of imaginary play, they would construct a fantasy together, where the cruelties of life lingered just out of frame, and they soon realised a world of which they could control, untainted by the reality which otherwise failed them at every turn. However, these fantasies only obstructed the dark existence of her life for just a moment. Her father, an alcoholic, inflicted obscene cruelties upon her from a young age. As such, Therese and her father had an extremely cruel and troubling relationship. Groomed from a young age to accept his inappropriate advances, Therese adopted the mantle of being the obedient child, perhaps surely as a coping mechanism to deal with the abuses inflicted upon her. However, as Therese grew older, Jeanette would soon become less of a covert personality within her mind, and would manifest into an overt alter, which expressed an oppositional outlook to the obedience Therese strained to uphold. Therese believed, due to the manipulations of her father, that he truly loved her, and blames Jeanette for a variety of behaviours regarding their father, primarily his depressive alcohol-induced state. Jeanette, through Therese's disparaging remarks, was promiscuous, inviting men around the house regularly. These were perhaps the first signs of Jeanette becoming a hindrance within Therese's everyday existence. As Jeanette became more rebellious, it soon began to creep in Therese's interactions with her father. The end point of this cruelty is split between the two altars. Therese believes that their father passed through his own means, allegedly not being able to deal with Jeanette's promiscuity. However, Jeanette recalls these events very differently. According to Jeanette, Therese had caught her altar with her father in another night of drunken cruelty, and in a fit of jealous rage, she took it upon herself to gain access to her father's hunting shotgun, and splattered his brains with deer shot all across the silly clown wallpaper. According to Jeanette, he died with a smile on his face. After these events, Therese was taken into an institution, where she remained until early adulthood. It is briefly hinted that this institution attempted to split Jeanette and Therese, through what means we are unsure. It is implied, however, that Therese escaped this facility, and through time, reunited with Jeanette, yet through the means of something far more sinister. 
Therese and Jeanette are perhaps the most recognisable Malkavians within the world of darkness. Their descent into the world of Knights happened within their recollection two lifetimes ago, through events which are murky within bloodlines but are far more clear within the wider lore of vampires. Their sire is a certain fifth generation Malkavian known as Jacob. The Encyclopedia Vampirica describes Jacob as a powerful kindred who resides within Milwaukee, particularly the kindred-dominated suburb of Greensdale. The suburb itself is reportedly undermined by his Malkavian mental state, which seemingly permeates every facet of this area. Jacob is not his real name, and it is believed he takes great inspiration for his personality from the Jacob found within Genesis. Whilst being a Malkavian connects Jacob with Therese and Jeanette in a manner of vitae, Jacob seemingly found a kindred spirit by sheer coincidence, when he found her within the city of angels. Jacob, according to vampiric lore, lives with schizophrenia, yet may have developed DID through the construction of his altar, Esau. The two are at constant war with one another, in perhaps a more severe conflict than that of Therese and Jeanette. It is said that any who try and interact with Jacob when he is fighting with Esau are often met with a swift death. Their internal struggle is devastating, but it came from a place of similar desperation to that of his child. Like Therese and Jeanette, Jacob's past was cruel and confined. Embraced in the year 750 AD, Jacob's mortal life was spent enslaved, to captors perceivably from the Umayyad Caliphate. Taken within his teenage years, Jacob was constantly inflicted with the loss of his dignity. In these dark times, he found that his only coping mechanism was the ability to control his appearance. Thus, Jacob always walked tall, strong, and appeared the archetype of a father figure. This would ironically become twisted when he met with Esau, who would twist the form he protected vehemently through the powers of obfuscate, transforming him into a monster against his own will. Jacob, much like his child Therese, is the business acumen between his personalities. Living in a grand mansion within Greensdale, he oversees the development of his domain, and has even grown ties with the Camarilla, an aspect of which is reflected through Therese's pursuits through bloodlines, and her own sympathies towards the Ivory Tower. Though all sympathies can be pressed to their limit, as we will uncover later. Esau, on the other hand, believes his brother is corrupt. The two have allegedly witnessed a dozen lifetimes of strife and vampiric war, having claimed to have seen Gehenna fall three times throughout their own life. As such, Esau believes Jacob is manipulating younger kindred into falling into his own chessboard, becoming his own personal pawns. Jacob, on the other hand, does not believe in the so-called eternal struggle of vampires, but such ambiguity causes a good amount of contention as to who is essentially telling the truth, an aspect which is very much embodied by his children. How Jacob and Therese met is an ordeal which is briefly mentioned in passing when Cuthbert Beckett interviewed Jacob upon the subject of Gehenna and his pursuit to uncover its mysteries. When Jacob is discussing the topic of Karna, the former regent of Clan Tremere in Milwaukee, it sparks a memory within him of Therese, stating, Karna, oh, she was a precious bird trapped in a smelly cage. Reminded me of a child of mine. Once I was pursuing activities in the City of Angels, I met such a beauty. Despite my age, she was attracted to me. I never saw one so vivacious, yet such delicate depths. She's a Baron of Santa Monica now. Such a delight. Esau had to go and ruin it by embracing her sister. Whilst this extract is brief, it offers a great amount of insight into the resurfacing of Jeanette in conjunction with Jacob and Esau. Through Therese in Bloodlines, we are made aware that she believes she embraced Jeanette personally, yet through the ties of blood, this compulsion may have threaded through from the essence of her sire. It would seem fitting enough that the mental state of Jacob and Esau reawakened Jeanette, yet the consequences of this become more dire, especially as the decades tick by. Like Esau, Jeanette within her vampiric unlife is one on the side of rebellion and mistrust, especially in stark contrast with her sister. While she is the face of Club Asylum and helps Therese maintain what could be described as good branding, she is the one who politically aligns with the sect which embodies her personality, being that of the Anarch movement. Whilst Therese within Modern Knights holds the barony of Santa Monica, it could be said her allegiances are murky to say the least, especially if we look into the events of LA by night. Within Modern Knights, the club asylum that we saw so prevalently through Bloodlines has now transformed into a worldwide franchise, rivaling that of Chicago's own Succubus Club. 
Dominating the club scene in the Americas, Asia and Europe, it would seem that the fantasy of ruling the world for the two sisters has been actualized. Whether this is a Pyrrhic victory, however, we will endeavour to unveil. The Vormans, as the years have progressed, have not made amends with each other. Whilst Jeanette remains the face and Therese the business acumen, their bitter relationship permeates through the very mention of each other's names to whoever is in control at that passing moment. Their relationship has deteriorated to the extent that the phrase to do a Vorman is a kindred colloquialism which refers to the act of making a member of your trusted coterie a sworn enemy. As such, Therese and Jeanette do not operate primarily in the same club. One takes ownership in Santa Monica and the other is in Hollywood, and as expected, you will never see one inhabit the other's establishment. None but the most trusted Malkavians know of their DID, but many rumours have spread about them into current nights, ones which have made them particularly more volatile to those around them, and especially those that infringe upon their business and their favoured kindred. Many anticipate that like Jacob and Esau, the Vormans will soon go to war with one another, and such can be seen through the events of the Camarilla re-emerging in the Anarch Free State through the claims of Praxis by Prince Vannevar Thomas. As Baron of Santa Monica, Therese has made a name for herself, not being renowned as a tyrannical ruler, but the Great Appeaser. It is inferred that the global expanse of Club Asylum was aided by the security of the Camarilla, having been permitted to export the business worldwide by the good graces of the Ivory Tower, at the expense of her towing the line. As such, the Camarilla has found business to be beneficial with Therese, as she is able to act as a middleman, so to speak, between the Camarilla and the Anarch movement. Jeanette, on the other hand, is vastly more sceptical of her sister, believing that while she occupies the office of Baron, she is, altogether, a potential turncoat in the grander plot to re-establish the Anarch Free State to its former glory. Whether either sister is to be believed about their opinions is a mysterious subject. It is evident that there is a fair amount of mistrust for Therese from members of the Anarch movement. Her policy of playing ball with the Camarilla has earned her a pacifist reputation, an aspect which does not sit well with every Anarch in the movement. Coupled with her soured relationship with her far more Anarch-aligned sister, it could be perceived that Therese could abandon the Anarch movement at any point, to seek greener pastures under the umbrella of the Camarilla. However, despite the mistrust exuding from some within the movement, Therese's plan of sabotage from the inside seems fairly well calculated, on top of her machinations through the powers of the blood. As a sixth generation vampire, her control over the abilities regarding dementation, the iconic ability of Malkavians are formidable. It is said that throughout the course of LA by Night, the degrading mental state of Prince Vannevar, causing his erratic decisions and outbursts, was due to an external force, unraveling his mental faculties, causing his grip on his own sanity to loosen bit by bit. This was, as revealed, a derangement placed upon the prince by Therese, who operated under the blanket of the Camarilla to weaken his own mental fortitude from the inside. Having pursued an official role within the Camarilla, being somewhat promised the title of Primogen, she was able to enact her work through a closer tie to the court at large. Her scheming, however, was not unnoticed. Therese specifically held the opinion that Malkavians were deemed overshadowed by their historic reputation, and made a conscious effort to use this belief to validate her position in the court, to make it clear that prejudice towards her clan undermined her own authority. However, hindsight is 2020, and with Prince Vannevar unveiling the truths behind her plot, it would soon culminate in a faster deluge than perhaps even Therese could have foresaw. For the time being in the prince's court, this derangement lasted a good amount of time. Therese was able to significantly weaken Vannevar, to the point that he required thaumaturgical assistance to clear his derangement for a fraction of a moment, to issue a terminal decree, resulting in a vicious blood hunt for the Vormans, which seemingly divided the Council of Barons within Los Angeles. Those that were sympathetic to Therese's decisions to go against the Camarilla through inconspicuous subterfuge regretted their decisions to not enact this plan fully. Yet those that did not trust Vorman were sure that her plan was only made to benefit her own survival. On top of all, the Malkavian known as X, who had recent personal ties with the Vormans, both Jeanette and Therese, expressed that she was choking Santa Monica, alluding to the sins of her sire, who enacted
enacted a very similar series of tactics to gain control over Greensdale. X, as the protégé of Therese, had a very complicated relationship with the Vormans to say the least. Under the domineering clutches of Therese, they learned to fear her. Yet within the jovial, fun-loving, yet erratic embrace of Jeanette, they could not fully leave the prison which the Vormans had constructed for them. X's strained relationship with Therese, however, seemingly came to an end after she forcibly locked herself within Club Asylum, where Jeanette would soon return to greet X with open arms. From there, Jeanette and X took over responsibilities befitting of a baron. Taking ownership of Club Asylum and attempting to hold some form of domain, the two made seemingly good partners in both friendship and, some would say, business as well. However, Jeanette's control could only last for so long, until the powers of the Second in Inquisition came knocking at their door. Both sisters held dominance in their own ways. Therese manipulates through fear, yet Jeanette through seduction and persuasion. However, Jeanette in particular could not hold her grasp on X for long. Unbeknownst to the Vormans, the Second Inquisition had gathered significant intelligence on the sisters to deem that they were one in the same. Having infiltrated Club Asylum and searching for X, they confronted the small group of kindred. Tempted by the Inquisition's promise to cure X of their beast, Jeanette tried to untwine the trap the Inquisition forces were constructing, and furiously so. As a lasting gesture of her decision, she decided to mutilate one of the members of the Second Inquisition retinue by tearing out his throat and painting the walls a certain shade of crimson that only an artery can ever present. Stating that she took a life for a life, she allows X to leave with the retinue, despite her utter disappointment in their decision. As a final gesture of her control over them, Jeanette displayed a morsel of her power, with the squad leaving imminently. The tale of Therese and Jeanette is a tentative one in modern nights. With the amount of knowledge the Second Inquisition have on them, it is difficult to know where they stand. Jeanette has carried on living her unlikely life to her utmost, being a public figure both in nightly life and on the vastly insecure internet, of which hunting entities have breached over and over to locate potential blank bodies. With Therese just out of sight, who can tell how many more nights Jeanette has ahead of her? The Vormans thrived under the conditions of prior nights, yet in this more unstable world of fanatical hunters and organized conspiracies, perhaps the changing of the tides will spell doom for these iconic sisters. Yet neither will go down without blood on their hands and crimson between their teeth. The Vormans, whilst being perhaps the most mistrusted vampires to walk the night, are formidable when it comes to surviving despite any and all hindrances. Powerful not only in their vitae, but their vast amount of experience, the two may weasel their way through the talons of the Second Inquisition, as Los Angeles relives another golden age of the Anarch Free State. With Jeanette currently taking control of the barony, Therese still lingers, permeating Santa Monica and awaiting her next move. Perhaps their fate will befall all that of their sire, and another Malkavian war with the self will wreak havoc across their domain. And yet, these mysteries are yet to be writ. All we can assume is that Santa Monica will continue to bleed with madness and ecstasy under the maddening control of Jeanette and Therese Vorman. Thank you for watching. The response to this idea was incredible, with over 2,000 votes cast and another 400 plus likes on the announcement for this installment. This was, however, a tricky video to make all said. As a character made for the Bloodlines game, Jeanette does not have a profound amount of legacy lore attached to her character, so a vast amount of research was put into going back through LA by night and picking up things from memory. So apologies if I left anything out. There may be some holes within this, as a lot of this comes from recall. I did leave some things out from the video. A note I found personally funny was that Jeanette has an OF account in LA by night, which surely wouldn't spell problems when it comes to the whole Second Inquisition poking about thing. So if you enjoyed this video, do let me know. The next one will probably be about Smiling Jack, who does have a good amount of lore for his character across a couple of books. If you do want to see more from the channel, do let me know in the comments, and perhaps even offer a like or even subscribe to watch more of my content. Until then, stay safe, and do not wander naively into the night.